Hello, everyone. My name is Igor, and I will do, do, give a talk about functional programming. And I will give you three reasons on why you should learn it. Yeah, this funny stuff here, you will understand it later, I hope. Uh, let me present myself first. Uh, I am from Brazil, and I am a software engineer at Team AC. And no, I don't know how to play football. Yeah, that's a bummer. And I don't know how to dance also. Yeah. And Java pays my, my bills, but Haskell is in my heart. Yeah, I like, like, I like Java a lot, but there are some things like Haskell that speaks directly to my soul. Uh, there's a little joke that my son will be called Haskell. Yeah, probably. Yeah, my wife is saying that it will not. That's okay. And I will start with a, a phrase from Charles Hur. He's uh, a Turing Prize winner, and he said that in his speech that there are two ways of constructing a software design. One way is to make it so simple that there were obvious no defi no obvious deficiencies, and the other way is to make that so complicated that there are no obvious deficiencies. The first method is far more difficult. And what does he want to say here? Like, it's way too hard to build a software that you can look at the code and say, yeah, there is no errors here. But it's far too easy for you to, to write a software, look like that, that insane amount of code, and you look at the, the, the method, the function says, yeah, I have no idea if this is good or not. And another phrase by John Hughes, He's a teacher and he teaches at Stanford, if I'm correct. And he says, our ability to decompose a problem into parts depends directly on our ability to glue solutions together. And what does he mean by that? When you are building a problem, and you have to, decom to decompose it. So how you decompose it, it will, uh, it will depend on how the glue you have allows you to, to glue the things together. So if you have like a, a language that's hard to glue things together, decomposing will be even harder. Well, let's start. Functional programming, what is it? Uh, if you like search on Google, you will find at least 20 different definitions for this, for what is functional programming. Uh, I like this one because it's like most of the functional languages follow this, the, this first three points and most of them follow also the last three ones. Uh, the functional programming, it must be declarative. That's like every single one of them. They are declarative. Uh, they must be immutable and they must provide higher order functions. That's like a requirement. There are some other teachers and other views that allow, that put more, more. How can I say? They have more requisites to do a, a functional programming to be a functional programming. But I like more these these ones. Also, it can have like static type system. It's not a requirement, but most of the nice ones they have static type type system. Pure functions and lazy evaluation. What is this? Like a uh, static type system is like languages like OCaml, Haskell, uh, the Java is static also, but like OCaml and Java, they have like the Hindley Mueller type, type system that they, it's like a strong way to, to define a type and derive a type. Pure functions that we will look later, how it work and lazy evaluation. What is lazy evaluation? It's like language that allow that you to define a function and this function will only be evaluated or and run it at when the user calls it, not when it's when, not when the function is defined. Here's like a, uh, a little comp com comparison about imperative and declarative. Like this one is listed in Python and the second one is in F sharp. Uh, as you can see, the declarative, like it's the it's a list comprehension that says, well, let's take the 
the, the range from the numbers from one to five, and then let's multiply it for two. And then you can see that the declarative way is you have a list, multiply it for two, return the old list. What's the difference in these both approaches? If you look at the imperative, imperative way, you are like giving an order, like you have like a, you can feel like you have a control, you are like, like more close to the von, von Neumann state, like, oh, I have a, a list and four, and you are saying to the, to the language, for this, for this list, apply to. In the declarative way, you are just saying to the compiler, I have this list multiplied for two. You don't say how it will do it. You don't have like a control stuff. You will just throw to the compiler and say, I want this, this, this list multiplied for two, and I don't care how. So you can see like a, a little difference there. Yeah, let's go to the a little bit about the mathematical basis of the functional programming. This dude is Alonzo Church. He was a he was the teacher of Alan Turing, and he was his he did his uh, he was the, the the teacher from Turing during his doctoral. He created uh, a mathematical basic called lambda calculus. And he and, Church and Alan Turing, they did a, th a thesis to together. That's the Church Turing thesis that everyone knows as the Turing machine and that kind of stuff. Formalization of programming. Uh, you, the Lambda calculus is like a mathematical basis of the functional programming. And it's like a way to represent the, how the computation works there. It's a simple programming language. It's not a programming language per se, but there are some implementations of Lambda Calculus as a programming language. So you can write programs using Lambda Calculus with, with type systems and so on. It's quite hellish, so I don't recommend that. It's a computation model. And how you can say that? Well, if it runs on a Turing machine, it can be represented as a Lambda Calculus. So for example, we have this lambda calculus term that is the free variable x and the free variable y. It's applied to the x and y function, x plus y function. And ta da, lambda calculus, this weird stuff on the opening is a calculus way to represent the number three. It's called the church encoding. So if you go to pure blame the calculus with no types that's how it will be represented the number three on uh on the on the mathematical form on itself let's go for the first reason it has no side effects almost no side effects i put the almost really small there but we I, we will get to there later yeah, why? Because code written in Haskell is guaranteed to have no side effects because no one ever will run it. So if no one will run it, we will have no side effects. And yeah, now that's a joke. Uh, actually, not that of a joke because it's quite hell to run a Haskell code and compile and stuff. But well, why it has no pure functions? Oh, it has no side effects. It has like four base topics that will allow this kind of the, this affirmation. Peer functions, uh, referential transparency, immutability, and monads. Uh, the, the first three ones are quite obvious. I will tell about them now. The last one is like when minds of people kind of explode because it's a different way to treat programming. And there are a lot of jokes about the last one that I will not make them because it's like cliche. And peer functions. Uh, how or what is a peer function? Uh, it's a function that given parameters, it will always return the same result for the same parameters. So if you have a function sum that sum two integers and you pass five and five, it will always return then independent of the parameters. So it's quite it's quite uh, obvious. 
it will in the function does not produce observable adverse effects. What does this, this mean? It can have like mutations inside the function, but uh, the result is not obs observable. So you it can do some mutations there, but it will always re always return the same result, independent of what the internal functions. Like for example, this is a Scala code, and you have two integers, and, you, and if you sum them, every time you if you pass all the same parameters, it will always return the sum. This one is, a, is an example, like you have like a mutations inside your mutation, this is the changing the sum for variable, but at the end it will keep returning always the same stuff. So it's still pure. What is, uh, how, when can we call uh, a function to be transparent? Uh, a function is transparent when it says ex execution independent from where the context, from where it is inserted. So. If you have a function in the, in the model y and the, you call that function in the model x and z, and depending on the on from where it was called, it will return always the same stuff for the same parameters. For example, this one is not a transparent function because there is a, a variable that is bleeding inside the function. The function, and the, this function as is also not pure because it's it can change its defining uh, depending on what there is in, in the model or class. And immutability in functional languages, everything is naturally immutable. And that means that when a value is assigned, it will never changes. So I, I, people ask, OK, so I have a variable we don't have the idea of variables there. Oh no, yeah, we have a variables, but the value of the, the variable can't be changed. You can reassign the, the variable, but never change its state. And most of people say, eh, that's not useful. Why I would want that? If I want a variable, I want to modify it. Well, probably you don't want to do that. Uh, let's get this as an example. We have a, like a, a method that receives a list. And this is in Java, so to, to, to give some background. And it will add like the hello to the list. What's happening here? Well, we are receiving uh, a list, a list uh, an object of a list. And then we are adding stuff there, but we are not returning anything. But what happens if you call this method inside uh, another function passing uh, a list there, you will mutate the, the list. So it will have uh, a, new, a new value in there. But if you look at the function, you say, well, this function returns nothing. So I don't expect it to, to change anything. And this is like one of the most common mistakes that new programmers, the new Java programmers do. They mutate lists inside of, of functions and they have like, a, like that spaghetti code that keeps mutating a list and it's hellish to find a problem later. Here we have, we have I have an example of a vector. It's from a library from from Java that it, it creates like immutable infrastructures. If you do the same code, you do the same stuff. When the, the function calls the, the vector, it will not mutate the, the vector. What it will do, it will add, it will copy all the old values to a new, to a new vector, add the new value, and it will return the new, the new vector. So if you wanted to mutate uh, a list, you would just change this void to a vector and it will to it you and you will have the new the new version of that of that list, and yeah, I, I know what you are thinking right now. That's not efficient in the memory way because you are duplicating a lot of stuff. Well, in pure languages, you in pure functional languages, you can look at the if you go to the implement to the 
virtual machine, if it is interpret interpreted and so on, you can see something like that, like for a map. You have a lot of a lot of keys, pair values and so on. And what, what will happen when you add a new value to a map? The compiler or the, the interpreter, it will just create a new pointer that will point to the old values in the old map and will just link to a new one. Why he does that? Because the language knows that the original map cannot be mutated, so it will never change. So it, it can only links the stuff there. So it's not that ineffective. And like even garbage collected collected languages will just de delete the, the original pointer and we'll just the, the old keep the the old the 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 objects that are still getting used if you use like object approach. Yeah, imperative programming is like this. You are like cycling and the language allows you to put a, a stick on the your on your wheels and then you will like fall down. And this is a functional bicycle. It will forces you to to not write wrong stuff. So we will not like fall down and break your teeth there. And now we go to the almost like almost almost every program needs to have an IO and IO naturally has side effects. IO is the most hellish of stuff in programming. Why is that? Well, because everyone assumes that IO will never fail and IO will fail like 50% of the times. And they where things can go wrong, like the database can be offline, users can input wrong data that will lead to side effects, and that's it. And now they're saying, oh, okay, you said that it was not side effects, you lied to me. No, I didn't lie to you. There's a way to deal with that in functional languages. Monads to the rescue. What are monads? Monads, it's a mathematical term to they are like type amplifiers. What this means, they wrap something to define a behavior. So let's, for example, I have a path to open a file. And I want to define a behavior to when will, what the, what we will do when a, the, the a file is open. So I will write a monad. That's like an IO monad. That's the most common one, and that will define uh, the behavior of opening a file. And then I can pass my type in there. That my type it's a path type, for example, inside the monad of IO. It will amplify the 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 path type to an IO of path type. So it will encapsulate that. That, that behavior. They are computational builders. Like I say, they define behaviors. And you can think of them like a common pattern in the object oriented languages. They remember they are not like the same, but if you know the command pattern, it's quite looks quite like that. And they are used to model side effects. So well to in a way that you want you, you know what's happening and how to react to that. For example, this is um, um, one of the most common uh, monads that we have in Haskell that we use a lot. It's called the monad maybe. You can think of the monad maybe as uh, optional in Java. Yeah, if you, you can call the optional Java a monad also because it, it will encapsulate and model a behavior. The behavior that, like the, the, that the optional encapsulates is that if a value a value is present or not. And this is the same behavior that we are mapping here in Haskell. What this function is saying? Well, if we have a value, return that, that value. If we have nothing, return nothing. If we have a value that we know that is there, we can apply the function to it. If the function fails, we return nothing. That's a pattern matching. You are like Building all the behaviors that that we want for that for that computation itself. So you know that anything that you pass to this monad will end with with the, these four states. So 
you can have side effects, but you know what those side effects are. For example, we can do a safe logging uh, in Haskell that if X, what, what I'm seeing here, we, see, we receive a, a float of A in an order of A, and if A is there, we can safe log it all. We can take, we can take the variable X, and if the X is larger than zero, we can log it. Otherwise, nothing. So what 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 we are seeing here? Uh, if the X is minus one, it will reach nothing. If the X is empty, it will reach nothing. So we are mapping a side effect based on an input from a user or input from a database or anything like that. Uh, well, OK, then. Like everyone, when I reach the Hesco part, they keep like looking. Yeah, I can see your faces, but I know that some of people are like, OK, I will believe you. Uh, reason number two, it's naturally parallel. And what does it mean? It has no shared states. In pure functions, better reductions can be done in parallel. What's better reductions? It's the way that the compiler executes the 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 function it has execution predictability and compiler optimization so what this means uh, like la languages like uh, erlang uh, elixir haskell you don't have to define a parallel execution for like a, a list comprehension or like a events listener the compiler knows that it can be parallel it can be parallel because there is no mutability, there's no side effects. So you don't have like to uh, like you do in Java. I want to reach a filter and a thread for that and control the threads. The compiler will do that for you. And that's like a huge gain. Before I go forward, I will have an example for the most interesting, the most important things on the functional programming. That's the first reason. And I have a code here to demonstrate some stuff. Let me share it. Yeah. Just a second. Just a second. Yeah, found it. OK, great. Let's, let's go, for example, we have this non-functional mail send. Uh, what we're doing here, we are creating a mutable email, a message body, we're getting the recipients, and we do a do send that we want to validate the object, and we'll send the mail, and if it goes wrong, it will throw an exception. Okay, let's think that this is a library that you don't have, you don't see the code. You are just a consumer for it. So let's take a look at the test. You are creating a message body that will mutate. That's ugly. A recipient, okay, that you mutate. You can they, you can forget to send this stuff because it's not obvious. You have like a lot of of a lot of setters and getters and blah blah blah. You send an email. You expect that we return the email that's sent. Okay, it will work. But what if it fails? What the function is telling you that fails? What will happen when it fails? It's telling you nothing. OK, you can you can like wrap the, the, the send mail to throw a, a checked exception, like a mail not send exception or an IO exception that the caller will, will take it and treat it, but that's quite ugly. Let's see how we can rewrite this thing in a functional way. Here's the code, what, what I'm saying here. 
it's like I have a mail that's immutable that will be clear to the to the user what you have to inform. I will send the email and instead of returning an immutable mail, I will return an either monad. What is an either monad? It's it, the either monad, it wraps the behavior of uh, success and failure. So this method will returns or an email on the right side or an error on the left side. So when I consume that, I, I will have the idea of what this, this function will return to me in the case of success, success in the case of a failure. Let's look at the test of it. For example, in the case of a success, the, it built the, the, the function correctly. It will send and it will return the either. So with this either, I can do a fold function. What does the fold function tells me? If it's okay, the mail it's sent, it will return me just a mail. I don't want to change it or do a treatment there. If it, if it fails, I want it to return an empty email. That's the behavior I want now. But in the case of a failure, okay, I want to, to do something with the error. So I can get from the response the left of it, and I can take the error and check, oh, there is an error there. So I can take the, the, the return of this function and build it with like another fun, another other functions like, Oh, if it's success, you will flow this way. And if it's an error, you will flow the other way. So it's clear for the consumer of your API what it had, what it can do. And doing that chain of, of functions, you can build like a railway oriented programming. I recommend to read that because it's a, a pattern that's quite nice to work with data flow events. Let me go back to the presentation. Yeah. Yeah, this is a, an example of a parallel beta reduction. It's from a language that's called formality. It uses like, it compiles the language to, to to a lambda terms that can be reduced parallel. I recommend to take a look on it. It's from a, a guy, he works at the Ethereum Foundation for the Ethereum blockchain stuff. And like they need like a lot of parallelism and smart contracts. It's a nice example on how a pure and well-written functional language is. Reason four, it's now mainstream. And why I say it's mainstream now. Since Java 8, we started to introduce functional stuff there, like lambdas. Everyone knows like lambdas now. It's a thing that came way before in functional languages. In Java 15, we will start to introduce pattern matching. That's like, uh, how can I say? It's a, a way that you, you can see it back there in the Haskell example. This is pattern matching. You can write a, a, a function that you can match all the actions that you want to do to, to do in that function. So if, if it's nothing, you do this. If it's just a value, you do that. It's just a, a nicer way to build ifs or something like that, but in patterns, not in imperative executions. And we have like, for example, Kotlin, and you have a library called Arrow for Kotlin that implements like tons of nice stuff uh, on it. Like the, the either monad and parallel execution and so on. On ECMAScript 6, that's the JavaScript, Six, you impl they implemented the map filter reduce and lambdas and, and arrow functions. That's like also something that helps you to build functional programming. 
we have the, the Facebook's Reason ML. What is the Reason ML? It's a language that Facebook, it's a, not a language, it's a superset of the OKML language that it can compile us to JavaScript, it can compile us to OKML, and it can compile us to directly to React. And it's like type safe, it has a uh, Hindley Milner type system that it, it often find errors that will only happen in runtime just in compile time. So if you write it correctly, it can it can show you errors that you will only find if you run the program, the compiler will show you there. We have like Microsoft F Sharp, that it's a shift, uh, .NET environment for functional. It's quite nice language. I use it to like it very much, but it does not work quite well in the in the new the new environment .NET Core yet. But they are moving to it. And what is in the future for the languages? Well, I don't know, but I can give a little bet. I what I can see right now, we have like smart compilers and dependent types. It's the, what is uh, is this? Well, for example, dependent types. There is a language called Idris that is like quite easy language to work with. That you can declare mathematical theorems in the in the language that will prove that your code is correct. And how is that? Well, let's think about. Oh, we have a, a vector of three three entities inside that vector. And we know that this vector have to be has to be three entities in that state of the program. So you create like a, a mathematical theorem on that using mathematical induction and so on that proves that the type will have the type vector will have three entities on that state. So the programmer will compile itself and they will do some mathematical theorems to prove that that's working. So we, it's quite amazing. There are Scala, there is support for that. Uh, they added support, like really bad support, but kind of works. It just takes like two hours to compile because it's like Scala, it's, it's slow to compile and this thing runs like tons of theorems and compile even slower, like uh, it's insane. Like a, a program with 10 or 20 dependent type functions take like 10 minutes to compile. It's insane. And materials for study. Uh, this first one, it's uh, EDX class. It's given by Eric Meyer. I think he was a teacher on the Utrecht University. He works for Microsoft and he's one of the developers of Haskell. He's like an amazing teacher. I watched this course, this course like two times already. It's amazing. We have this book, SciCP. It's free. It's a perfect book to make comparisons about uh, languages and stuff. And we have this concepts, techniques, and models of computer programming. It's one of like a must read for every developer, I think, because it will go from functional programming to declarative programming, logic programming. We compare them and it's amazing. So you know how things are in different languages, in different paradigms and so on. And we have this GitHub. It's from the creator of Formality, the language I showed before. He's also a Brazilian and he works for the Ethereum Foundation. And his GitHub is amazing because he's creating a language, uh, a functional, pure functional language. And he has, he has all the medium, he creates like a, a lot of mediums, articles, on describing every step of creating a functional language, all the theories behind it, and it's quite nice. It's good. And to end, of course, we have a how to kill a, dra a dragon with Haskell. Well, you just have to implement like a monad to capture the dragon side killing effects, and the 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 villagers that start to be concerned, they call you up wizard and so on, and then you need help because it's quite hard. And you, if you start to study a lot, you start to get a little bit crazy. And that's it. We have like 10 minutes for questions and stuff.
Thanks a lot, Igor. I really enjoyed your talk. Really clear, clear examples, excellent memes, of course, and lots of research materials. Uh, I still have a question in the Q&A. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, also, also I, I'm going to mute, mute yourself. yourself. Sorry, sorry. So, so, so the question first is, if the functional languages are so safe and cool, why are they, are they not common? Yeah, why they are not common? First, uh, we have such a, a great, uh, like 10, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, there was such a great lobby from Microsoft and, and, all, and Sun at the time to push like Java and the .NET environment in universities and stuff like that. So uh, something like the object-oriented and imperative program, programming took all the market. And we also have the problem of, uh, at that time, like 20, 30 years ago, computational was quite expensive. So functional programming is a little further away from the von Neumann architecture. So it has, it will take more cycles. The performance can be, it will be worse in like single thread environments because, well, in functional language, you, in this natural parallel, but if you have just one thread, they will not gain nothing for it. We we'll just have one more stuff over it. And that's why just now it's appearing new. The, there's a boom of functional programming because now we have resources to spare. To spare. So we, we, we will gain a lot with parallelism and the, 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 the cycles we have over it, it will compensate by the, the parallelism that we gain from it. Okay, great answer. Another question I see is, I find functional programming a bit unclean code. Is this a common misconception or is it just a sacrifice that you have to make? Uh, well, I think it's different and it's not like ugly or it's not clean code. It's just the way you write is different. Like you, uh, uh, the example I gave for the mail sender. If you build in the right way, you can see it's more clear, but there's like a problem with, with our, our mindset. Since we work like all day with imperative programming and object-oriented programming, our mindset will go over this way almost all the time. And we, it's natural to have like the resistance to think on another way. But if you get used to it, you will see the advantage to use functional programming in certain, in certain areas, but it's not like, no areas, it will be more clean. It can happen to be uglier to modulate some problem that needs mutation, for example. I see, yeah, getting used to it definitely makes a difference. Another question is, can you describe Kotlin as a functional programming language? Because almost all the features that you mentioned are in Kotlin. Yeah, Kotlin can be like uh, can be a functional language if you you follow all the uh, the requirements of functional language, like you only work with pure functions and so on. It can be worked as a functional. It it will do not have like all the the wins because the it it will still run over the JVM and the JVM lacks for some support, but it's. You can, yeah, you can assume it's a functional language also. Oh, glad to hear that. Last one for the Kotlin enthusiasts out, out there. One other question from Lambda. Since we read code much more often than we write it, do you think that functional programming languages are readable, readable enough to write maintainable code in general purposes? And also this is similar to the question, why don't you see functional programming in production? Yeah, I think it's easier to read if you take some nice written codes in functional programming. I can go from mind here. You can go to GitHub and take a look at, at Xmonad. It's a tiling window manager for Linux that is written in Haskell. And if you look at the code, it's so clear that you don't need like not even a single comment on the entire code to see what's happening because it, it's all mapped correctly. You can see the returns like the, the function it tells you what is happening and you know that there's no side effects in there 
the function will do what it's telling that it will do. So it's quite easy to, to read. And for production, like, yeah, I can I see a lot of uh, functional programming in production, uh, but it quite depends on where they are. Like, uh, I, there are some friends working some fintechs in the United States and back in Brazil also, like the, they work with Clojure, that it's a functional program, a functional program inside the, over the JVM. Like this, there's a fintech that's the bigger fintech in Brazil called the New Bank. They all its code is written in. If I if I'm correct, they have Go for some stuff that can be right from can be used for. For. For some desk intensive stuff, but the, most of the code is written in Closure also. And we have like a lot of I can see a lot of Elixir in some kind of some enterprises on some fintechs that I know that like Brex, that's the corporate credit card that's in San Francisco. I know the CTO from it. They use F sharp in some stuff. They use Elixir in other stuff. And Go in others in some other stuff. So it quite depends on where in production you are looking at. OK, thanks. Uh, another question is, do you like Scala? Well, I don't like Scala a lot. If the the language on itself is quite OK, but the environment is quite hurtful because it takes a lot of time to compile. And uh, when it changes a version, it breaks all the dependencies and you have to recompile all the dependencies. It's it's in syntactically it's a nice language, but the environment's not that nice. I think I, for a JVM environment, I would go or with Kotlin or with uh, Clojure. That's more pure. And easier to work with. All right, thanks for answering all the questions. Uh, functional programming is a really modern topic with Kotlin also becoming so famous nowadays. So let's continue this discussion in the, in the chat room that we have. Uh, if you have any other questions, we have a few minutes if you want to post them. I see some suggestions here like immutable lists are used in Java since streams. Uh, before that, there was Guava. Yeah, Is yeah. That also true? Yeah, yeah, it's true. You can use like immutable. There, there are immutable lists on on Java, and there was a, like a lot of libraries that that blocked some functional programming inside Java on itself. There's one that I like a lot that is called Cyclops. It brings like tons of functional programming stuff, like I showed the either monad on on the the, the 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 code. It has like implementation of Simulation of high, highly kind of types. It's quite amazing. But that's correct. Nice. OK, there are also a couple of recommendations for Haskell and also for functional programming, I see. We'll post these links in the, in the Google chat as well. Great. Uh, Igor, thank you a lot for your talk. It was really nice. Thank you.